thank you very much uh, for the introduction and welcome to all of our attendees today. Um, first and foremost, let's uh, go through the COVID um, protocols once again. Um, people, we all uh, know and hear that the numbers are climbing once again. So, yeah, just a reminder, please always wear your mask, wash your hands with soap or an alcohol-based hand sanitizer. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, or mouth with unwashed hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze with a flexed elbow or tissue, and then throw the tissue in the bin. Clean and disinfect your frequently used surfaces and objects. And in the season that we are entering, I think we need to also add uh, social distancing. Please, guys, uh, I know we are social social animals, but um, I think we need to just keep that in mind when we get together with family, friends, um, and keep our distance, please. Um, Herman, can, uh, you want to say something quickly? Everything that you've said, I just support for <laughs> the moment. Now, welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, Herman Strauss, here to support our presenter, Harry, today. Um, and yeah, let's Looking forward to the interesting discussion coming up. So what we are going to do today, we're going to talk about uh, multiple Giza installations. Um, and the reason why we are doing this is we come across these uh, installations fairly often. And there's always the question as to what do we do regarding the installation? You know, how do we do this? How do we make sure that it complies, this, that, and the other? So. Let's step right into it. We will look at the SANS regulations regarding installations. Once again, maybe a, a little bit boring for most of you. Uh, we'll just go through the vacuum breakers, anti-siphon anti loop, the pressure rating things, and then we're going to look at Giza's um, connected, connected in series and also in parallel. So, um, so what does the regulation say about vacuum breakers? And you all know this, but I'll just repeat it and you'll see, you'll understand later why we are doing this. In terms of uh, 10252, vacuum relief valve shall be installed on the inlet and outlet in the following positions to prevent drainage of the heater and collapse of the heater. Number one, as close as practicable to the heater that is to be protected and on upstands that are, that are provided in both the, the cold water feed pipe two and the hot water feed pipe from the heater. Um, okay, and then we all know about the 300 millimeter situation, depending on the manufacturer's installation, as well as the local authority. So I'm just going to breeze through this quickly. Um, then if we like, have a look at the anti-siphon loop. Um, backflow prevention devices. Any backflow prevention device shall be installed in such a position that, in the case of a vacuum breaker, it is installed in an appropriate anti-siphon loop and this is a picture out of the regulation where it indicates what the anti-siphon loop is all about obviously higher than the top of the geyser and our cold water vacuum breaker at the top there so our basic installation that we're all familiar with horizontal installation um, the basic picture you all know you all familiar with this so i'm not going to spend time on this one Vertical, same situation with the anti-siphon loop, the vacuum breakers, everybody, everything basically is the same. Why are we looking at this today? Um, Herman, I don't know if you want to maybe just uh, have a quick uh, uh, information session regarding the reason for this today. Um, thanks, Harry. Yeah, the, well, again, let's be straightforward with each other. One of the reasons why we actually talk about this is because the standard don't. So while while 10252, if we if we go back to the reference, what do we use to to, to make sure we are, we we do the installation safe and correct? It's either Sands 10254 that is very specific to Giza, and Sands 10252 Part One that addresses all water installations, but it, it's it's broader. It gives more detail. So we've gone through all of that, and while there are some references to to multiple geysers being installed, 
it doesn't tell you exactly what to do and how to do it. There's some principles to apply. So the, the whole part of the, this, this, this presentation is to, to try and highlight what are the minimum requirements when you do something like that, and then some practical considerations. Because in this case, the practical considerations is much more important than just trying to stick to the minimum minimum requirements. You can you can potentially comply with the minimum requirements and still give your customer something that's not really going to do the job the way it should. So, um, yeah, Harry. Okay, so, and I think another thing thank that you. we need, sorry, uh, thank you, Herman. And another thing that we need to also consider in this situation, um, which might be more pre prevalent, is the manufacturer's uh, warranty and guarantee conditions. And you will see um, we've included three different uh, manufacturer labels here. And all of them refers to that specific user being compliant to 10254 and 10252. Um, so we got to be careful when we do these type of, types of installations because obviously the most uh, or the reason why the, we have multiple geysers is to increase the volume of hot water. Now, you will find often um, that if it's a new installation, you might be lucky enough that you have the same uh, type of geyser. In other words, either a quick hot on both or heat tech or whatever the, the product is, you will have the, both, the, the same geysers. But it happens often that you will have two geysers connected to each other, which are different manufacturers. For instance, you might have, in the next picture I'll show you, you will immediately see that we've got a, an installation where the geysers are connected to each other, but it's two different manufacturers. You see the geyser at the back there. That's obviously a Heatec or an Ariston geyser. And the one in the front here is a quick hot. Now, if we look at these in isolation, each manufacturer, when there is a warranty claim, they're going to come out, they're going to do an inspection, and they're going to say, okay, we will either honor or we're going to void the warranty. And I think that's one of the biggest um, points that we need to consider when we do these installations. Over and above for the fact that the SANS code um, basically talks about a single installation, we also need to, and we need to take cognizance of the manufacturer's um, installation and warranty conditions. So in this instance, clearly, if there is a problem with, let's say, the Picot geyser, which it looks like it might happen soon. Um, Picot will come out, do an inspection. If the installation does not comply, in other words, that specific installation, not the connection in between, but that specific geyser installation, they might tell you, sorry, we're not going to honor the, the warranty. So I think that's one of the biggest challenges that you will have out there. And although there are a lot of non-compliances on this specific picture, uh, the basic idea is to understand that each geyser installation, whether they are connected to each other or not, should still comply on its own. So let's have a look and see what, what uh, we are talking about. Pressure, regulating valves, uh, once again, the main shutoff for ease of maintenance, the, the inlet pipe to a pressure control valve, to a float valve, shall be furnished with an isolating valve. An isolating valve shall not be provided between any pressure reducing valve and a water heater if such a pressure reducing valve incorporates an expansion device. So I think that's the one thing that we need to just keep in mind as we move forward through these uh, installations and these examples that we're going to show. So expansion relief, expansion control valve on the cold water supply. When an inspection, uh, expansion control valve is installed on the cold water side of the water heater, it shall be installed downstream of any isolating valve, gate valve, non-return, and whatever else you might find. Okay, so let's have a look at pressure rating. So we all understand, and once again, that this might sound a bit monotonous, but you'll see where I'm going, going forward. In this case, we have a geyser. Uh, if, I, if I can, if 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 I can just quickly interfere sorry, there, uh, Harry. Sorry, sorry for that. Uh, sure. I just want to remind everybody. Remember, 
it's important to go through these basic principles because this is all that leads into the practical application at the end of the day. We, we have to be reminded of what we're looking at, why we're looking at it, so that we can make the informed decision at the end on how to connect more. 100%. Thank you, Herman. So, yes, guys, so just to come back to this 400 kPa geyser, and we all know that the geyser is the center and the, the most important part of this installation. So we need to match our valves according to the geyser pressure rating. In this instance, 400, 400 PRV, 400 TP, everybody is happy. And yes, it's smiley faces. The same goes for the 600. 600 kPa, um, TP, PRV, everything is hunky-dory. This is where the challenge comes. Obviously, 400 kPa Giza, 600 kPa, that is not a match. So, unfortunately, no smiley faces there. Um, in this instance, if we have a 600 kPa, remember, you can always go down on your pressure rating when it comes to valves, but you cannot go higher. So, this is still acceptable. Everybody is happy. Now, this is the installation or one of the installations that I recently came across. And you will immediately see there is a challenge here. So once again, two different products. Number one. Number two, in, on the right-hand side, you have a 400 kPa geyser with a 400 kPa TP valve. And in normal circumstances, that seems to be fine. On the left-hand side, we have a 600 kPa geyser with a 600 TP. And that also seems to be fine. And also, what happened in this specific instance is that we have got one PRV feeding both of these geysers. So that, um, and it's also, as you can see, a 600 kPa. So now, all of a sudden, this creates a whole different scenario. Because for, for the geyser on the left, that's fine. But for the geyser on the right, it's obviously a problem. So here we're sitting. So in this instance, on the right-hand side, that is not um, the correct thing to do. But as I say, on the left-hand side, everything seems to be fine. So what we, what we in this instance, what should have happened here, or what would have been recommended, is to have a 400 kPa PRV, which would then eliminate the problem. So we still have a 600 on this side and a 400 on the other side, um, and that is acceptable. Arman, I don't know if you have any, please jump in if you have any in, uh, thing that you need to add. All right, guys, so what are we looking at here? The challenge that we have with that is in the left hand, on the left hand side, we have got a 600 kPa TP valve. And I think we all understand if we have 600 on the one side, 400 on the other side, we are most probably going to have a challenge. If your green geyser, let me call it that, the green geyser, the 600 kPa geyser, has got uh, an overheating issue, then obviously that uh, TP should discharge at some other time. But due to the fact that there's a huge difference in the pressure rating of the TP valves, you will most probably find that your 400 kPa TP is going to be the one that will discharge first. Uh, and I hope that makes sense. It should, because obviously this is the lower pressure rating. So this one will discharge first. And, you know, everybody uh, understand. So the client will phone up and say, listen, we've got water coming out of this valve or this thing. And Nine times out of 10, the plumber will go out and try and find the problem with this specific geezer, not even thinking about this situation. And that is, I think, why it is important to understand the workings of, of these things and why we are saying, although in a single installation, this is fine, in this type of situation, this might not be the right thing to do. Because, as I say, you're going to spend a day, two days, to try and rectify this issue on the right-hand side. Um, although the challenge or the uh, breakdown might be on the opposite user. So, 
just for uh, information and for, I think, to save yourself a lot of issues and heartaches and time and effort, um, it would be advisable to make sure that you have at least or try, even if this is a 600 uh, kPa geyser, make sure that your pressure rating on your TP valves are the same and the similar to your PRB. So in this instance, I would have gone and said, okay, let's go down in pressure instead of going up. So, and I think this situation is self-explanatory. This will work. So guys, let's look at geysers um, in Siri, for instance. And in this instance, I've, I took the picture out of the sans code. Uh, sorry, not out of the sans code. One of the pictures that's out there on the uh, internet. And all it shows basically are two installations, the same installation, just duplicated. So for all practical purposes, a geyser installation that's done in Siri is basically this. The only difference is that Giza A and Giza B is now being interconnected. In other words, we have your cold water flow coming in on the first Giza, being heated here, and this Giza now pre-feeds the second Giza. So that's the only difference between the two, or, or in, in this installation, is that link in between the Gizas. For all practical purposes, um, please, uh, attendees, your Giza installation must be seen in isolation. Each tank must comply still to the sense code. So the question of how many vacuum breakers, um, what do we do here? I think this will answer your question. So you will have in this instance still vacuum breaker on the cold inlet, on the hot outlet, on the, on the next geyser, similar thing. So exactly the same picture, except for this link in between. So you can go one step further here, yeah, and would might, which might be uh, sensible in view of the access accessibility uh, situation, where the sense codes tell us all devices shall be readily be readily accessible for ease of maintenance or testing. So it might be a sensible thing to do is to have an isolating valve between the two geysers, so that we don't have to drain in let's say it's to 150, 300 liter to service the geyser but that we can isolate and attend to the problem or to the specific problem. Keeping in mind, if we do that, we have to then install another expansion relief valve between that isolating valve and the next geyser. So those are geysers in series. Now let's look at parallel. And uh, we might have two different types of parallel uh, installations. The first one is where we have the cold water supply, one PRV on the, on the left-hand side here, cold water supply to our geysers, number one, number two, balanced cold water supply going that direction, and then we have a common hot water supply going to the house. So this will all be determined by what you, or what your configuration or your site tells you. Um, you might have the situation where two geysers need to supply for different parts of the house. It all depends. You'll have to do an assessment to make sure what is the right configuration for that specific installation. And if we look at the next one, we might have a common cold water and then split to the two geysers. Uh, and that, this is 100% correct, but you might need to do the next thing. Cold water supply, and you need might need to do a PRV for this geyser and a separate PRV for the second geyser. And the reason why that might need might be needed is due to the friction losses that you're going to experience due to the amount of pipe work, and obviously your flow rates are going to be influenced if you have too much movement, too much elbows, and all of these things that's going to interfere. So let's go back to our first example. In this instance, once again, it would be advisable when you have one PRV, once again, to have an isolating valve in between with an expansion valve there 
so that if you have a problem with one of the geezers that you can isolate to attend to that problem. And I've also added at the back here, isolating valves on the separate geezers for the hot water supply. And as I said, this is, might be the other scenario that you might come across where you have got different parts of the house being serviced by different um, hot water supplies. In this instance, you might decide to split the installation where you have one geezer supplying the main ensuite and the bathrooms and the other geezer supplying the kitchen, laundry, maybe even the servants' quarters. So, but guys, this is the basic, um, how can I say, the best, I think, scenario to try and accommodate this type of installation. And one thing that we didn't touch on today that I just want to mention quickly is always keep in mind your supports. Um, you can imagine if you have two 150 liter geysers right next to each other, you might have challenges with roof support where this might be insufficient. So this is basically what um, I bring to you today. I don't know whether Herman or Steve has got something that they want to add as well. We might have lost Herman again. Uh, no, I think you've covered it all. I think it's just to go and have a look in, in, in terms of, um, you know, the type of installation, what's going to be best served. So as you have here, where it's splitting, uh, and, you know, you can do that. Uh, in my mind, I prefer to have the two of them connected to one line, but that's just my preference. Uh, but thanks, Gary. So, yeah, once again, it will all, I think, mainly come down to the type of installation, the type of property that you are in, uh, you need to to find and, and find the best way to get these uh, installations done. Okay, any questions, Karim? Uh, I can't see whether there's anything there. Can you please, uh, if there's any questions? Yes, I see there's a question that uh, just came through. I was told by an auditor that a TP valve, a TP valve supplied must be used and not changed. TP valve supplied. I can't, I can't don't understand yeah, so the question. What, what the question is that if the geese is rated at 600 kPa, then the TP must remain at 600 kPa. You can't take it down to a 400 kPa in terms of, of uh, the 151, et cetera, et cetera. Well, in that instance, yes, that might be reality. But again, once again, if we look at the installation, although each installation or each geyser will be looked in looked at in isolation. We also need to look at the complete installation and whether that is going to affect what is happening uh, between the two geysers. Steve, I don't know if you want to expand on that. Yeah, I think your challenge is going to be that, you know, if one of your geysers is rated at 600 kPa, it does become a challenge because, again, if you go and remove the, the, the 600 kPa TP and you put a 400 kPa in, then it could affect the warranty in terms of, of the, the geyser and also the 151. Because remember that geyser is tested uh, with that 600 kPa TP valve. So dropping it down in terms of the pressure control valve is fine, but the TP has to remain as it is. Yeah, that's uh, understandable. Um, so, yeah, you know, guys, there's not a there's not a golden rule here. Once again, as I say, if we look at the the, the SANS ten two five four, that says that uh, you know the pressure rating must be the same throughout. So we got to be I don't know, you know, there's not really a golden rule, and there's nothing um, in the SANS code that is going to say you are wrong when it comes to uh, to the question where you did install the 600 kPa on that. The only challenge is going forward, the next guy coming to do maintenance or that actually get the service call might get very confused. And as I said earlier, he might spend a lot of time on the wrong gears of trying to find the problem. So I cannot find anything wrong with, with the statement or with a question 100%. But uh, once again, I think it will all be on. Uh, we need to consider what do we do in this specific situation. Herman, are you there? We seem to have lost him now totally. Guys, uh, okay. So any other questions, Karim? I see there were two other questions that were answered uh, by Herman uh, via okay. the chat. 
uh, but I'll just read them out uh, in case you want to expand on those. Uh, so the first question is TP valve must match, must the TP valve match the Giza pressure rating? Um, and uh, the answer from Herman was, it may be at a lower pressure than the Giza, it just may yeah. not be more than the Giza rating. Yes. So once again, that also connects to the other question we just had now. So uh, once again, it's going to come back to the, the manufacturer. And, and that's where we have a gray area that might become a challenge. Uh, but yes, uh, in all, for all practical purposes, in terms of the regulations, you can, you may go down, but you can't uh, go up. So yes. What's the other one, uh, Karim? Yeah, the other one was, I was under the impression you can't put a lower rated TP valve in a Giza. And the reply was, you may do that. The TP may not be higher than the Giza, though. Yeah. So the, pre the Giza, once again, the Giza is the center. And you need to work around that. So if you have a 600 um, Giza, you may, uh, in terms of the regulation, install a lower pressure. In other words, a 400. Um, yes, it is allowed. Now, from my side, thanks uh, once again for, for attending. Um, hopefully this gave you a bit more information and it will help you uh, in these types of situations uh, to have a look, have a better look and do a better assessment regarding what needs to be done for that specific installation. Other than that, thank you from my side. Thank you for the past year. Um, I think this is most probably the last time you're going to hear my voice this year. So thank you very much for your participation, for being patient with us. Stay safe, have a very good Christmas, and if you're going somewhere, please drive safe, stay safe, wear your mask, and do the right thing. Thank you from my side. Yeah, just a uh, thanks to Kerry and to yourself and to, to Hanman for getting up early this morning and to those all in attendance. I think next week is our final uh, Business 101 and Tech Talk, so we'll just be rounding off the year. But again, uh, just to reiterate what, what Kerry said, um, just just make sure when you're up in that roof and you're checking that you take all of these things into consideration when, when you're looking at that installation. Like they say, if it walks like a duck and cracks like a duck, it may not be. So just go through those checks and balances. And then obviously communication with the consumer being the key component to where you are and how you're doing things. And each installation, again, depending on what it supplies, et cetera, um, again, just have a look and go from there. Thank you so much.